ready to go to add some more stuff. Now, if you're wondering what exactly it is that we're going to be adding, we're going to be adding little pin headers like this here. See if that'll get focused in on that. There we go. These will solder directly onto the boards. Well, those aren't cut the right lengths, but I can still use one of these others to kind of show you. But they'll be soldered into the board. Similar to this. And again, this one's not the right length either. These are some extras I had laying around. But uh, those will get soldered into all the pin holes where the uh, PPU and the CPU were. And then from there, I have another set of them. They're, they're a slightly different type. They are double pinned on both sides. And let me get one of the other boards out here and open it up so we can show how it's going to look. I do really like the fact that all of these uh, boards are actually in static bags, anti-static bags. That's very, very cool. There we go. Just peels right off. <clears throat> so here's the one for the CPU. So you can see that there's holes along the top two sets of rows, front to bottom. And so basically how this all works is, and again, this is also silk screened on the end with that notch to match which direction the pin was in. So in the case of the CPU, which was right here originally, this board will sit thusly, just like that. But it has its own set of pins, which are double rows. Let me see if it'll focus on those. There you go. So that'll push up through the board on one side, and it is marked specifically which ones go to which. And they're really tiny, I can't see that writing. <clears throat> so let's put on my cheater eyes. Okay, top row. <clears throat> so what'll happen is I'll take these pins and I'll feed them through. Like that on the board. And then I'll have to cut it off on the end here and do that on the opposite side, solder that down. And what'll happen is that'll provide me with the connections I need once everything's in place <clears throat> to push it down securely. So that's where we're off to. Uh, the next sets of races. So let me get these headers and interposer boards out of the way and prepared. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna have to do some minor repair on one of these because when I was cutting these header pins here, one broke off too short. And long story short, <clears throat> it disappeared into another dimension. So I don't know where it jumped off to, and that's my fault. I should have been more careful when I was clipping it. But that's okay because uh, I'm gonna use the same repair. I'll use a similar thing to repair it, and that is why I like to keep off to the side those leads that I clip off of large capacitors. So what I'll do is I'll just feed this through at roughly the same length as the other pins and then I'll solder it down and uh, it'll it'll become the missing leg that I need to snap this thing down so it'll be fine I'll make it work it'll be good all right <clears throat> in the meantime I got these other ones to worry about so I will go ahead and start soldering some of these down on the PPU at least I'll take this out of the way for now We'll come back to that in a second. So all I'll have to do is just kind of set that down like that. Make sure I'm right about 
which side to solder on here. Yeah, nest pin 20, nest pin 21, good. And then PPU pin 21, so we are good there. All right, be right back and get started. Okay, that's some of the more difficult work taken care of there. Now we need to get the socket headers installed onto the main board itself. So again, an easier way to do that, or an easiest way to do that, is just to take the chips themselves with the uh, socket headers already placed on them, and then just place them into the board. It's a little extra plastic on there I don't like. Let's trim that off. And so, yeah, that'll fit in there just dandy like that. Holding this in can be a bit of a trick. So, what I will sometimes do is I don't want to damage anything else, of course. So, I'll use one of my tools here, like maybe the uh, side cutters, and I'll place them down as leverage. Unless, of course, the chip slips out. All right. So again, I'll place it down on top of that as leverage to hold the pins down for me. I'm sure there's better ways to do this. In fact, I know there is, but that's okay. This will work for what I'm doing. And same thing, I'll just put down the uh, corners of these pins to get everything in place. Okay, that's looking pretty good. See if it'll focus in on that. There we go. Yeah, CPU and PPUs in place and ready to go. Those little black marks are my pen marks earlier from where I was marking where I had to apply additional solder when uh, it was fighting me. I can use some alcohol and a Q-tip to remove that later. So, yeah, be right back. Okay, a quick addendum here. Um, and this is my fault, so 
keep in mind, learn from my mistakes, don't replicate them. And that's why I'm mentioning it in this video. So one of the things I didn't do that I should have done, and it's actually two things, is that uh, it's going to be difficult for me <laughs> to solder on the top row of socket connectors on the interposers that the actual processors will go back on for the simple fact that now that I have the interconnect headers in place, uh, I really don't have much room to actually solder those pins onto. So, yep, that's my mistake, my fault. Don't replicate that. I'll have to fight with that here in a little bit and I'll just take care of that. But more importantly is this. So when you take the processors themselves and you separate them and you take them off the boards, make sure that you note which one is which because they are the same size chip and they're very similarly labeled. Uh, so yeah, very important that when you remove these, notate them, put them off to the side, or actually do what I did and use a Sharpie to write on there which one's which. Additionally, the second part of this lesson is don't believe everything online. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I took the chips off, uh, wasn't sure exactly which one was which, so I thought I was being smart, and I went and I googled the chip numbers, and found what looked like to be a pretty reliable source because it was giving me all the Rico specs of the chips, and these are Rico made chips. Uh, and I went by what they said and popped everything in and fired up this thing just to give a test run before I finish it up, and I got nothing. And that's because this website actually had the two chips identities reversed. They actually had the one marked that's actually the CPU. They have it listed as the PPU and vice versa. And of course, that's not correct. Thankfully, having the chips in uh, in the wrong slot sockets doesn't cause any permanent damage. I just got a blank screen and nothing. So all I had to do was just power everything off, re-verify the chip identities, which then told me it was the other way around on different websites. Uh, I confirmed that through Clov and through ArcadeComponents.com and a few other resources put the chips into the right sockets, and then I got a working Nintendo again. So yeah, just a quick addendum. Make sure you identify and properly label the chips if you aren't sure which are which. Lessons learned. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and do what I would consider the next most difficult part of this project, and that is that I have to modify the case itself back in this area to make room for the HDMI port that will be getting added. So again, I have to make room for that to pop through. Uh, there is a template from the Game Tech Game Dash or Game Tech Dash US website that you can uh, print off to help with this. And that's what I've done is I've printed it off. Now I will tell you that the default image graphic that it saved was not in the right size uh, when I first tested this. So I actually had to measure this uh, as close as I could um, width wise and uh, everything to make sure it would line up. Um, so yeah, so be aware of that, that uh, you may have to measure that and check that out. Hopefully it'll print properly for you, but on my program it was not able to do so. So what I'm going to do is uh, to carefully tape this on and then mark out, cut out this section here which is where the HDMI port will need to come through and then that in turn will cut out here along the bottom of the case. Additionally, to make room for the board that goes in here, I will have to remove this post have to completely cut it out as well. And then another part of this, because once you've done all that, this won't have a, a good secure fitting in there. It'll kind of be loose in there. So right here on this board is a nice little hole surrounded by a nice ground plane. And what that's for is, is I'm gonna to have to get uh, probably like a quarter inch uh, drill bit, and I'm gonna to have to drill through that and through the case around here. And then this kit came with a screw right here that I can feed through and fasten it down. So that's what I'm gonna go do now. I'm gonna go modify the case and uh, be right back. So update on where I'm at at this point. <clears throat> um, I have already got the case 
uh, with the hole cleaned out and uh, drilled out for it, the HDMI connector for the new board here. Uh, I went ahead and since I already had the case apart to get the hole drilled out, I went ahead and cleaned it. It was pretty uh, uh, scuzzy inside of it, so that's drying. So while I'm waiting for that to uh, dry and get settled up, uh, there's some additional solder work, minor solder work that's still required. Again, part of what this modification does is add a new switching power supply circuit to the Nintendo so that the old uh, 7805 regulator is no longer required. Um, but you still have to get power to the board. So what you do is right here off of the old RF uh, or the power RF modulator board, this is where the uh, old 7805 used to be. And I'll attach it back on there, <clears throat> but not just yet. And that's because I've got a length of about, uh, I don't know, six, seven inches worth of wire here that I'm going to solder uh, in place of where it's needed from off of the old uh, 7805 regulator to the points required on the new HDMI high def nest kit. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to get these wires soldered up real quick and get this ready to go. The center pin is ground and that was very easy to determine by simply taking my meter and just putting it into continuity mode or diode mode and just put one lead on the center pin and the other one on the shielding for the RF modulator or any other ground point on the main board. So that's easy enough. So that's definitely ground. The way I determined which one was voltage was uh, just to make sure I went ahead and, and plugged everything back in, put the power switch back on it and powered it up without the regulator in place. And by doing the same check, I had a voltage reading of roughly 14 and a half volts. So, um, and that's actually AC power in this case uh, because the Nintendo outputs AC. So yeah, without a load on it, it's got quite a bit of juice that comes out of that volt, out of that uh, wall warp. But that's how I was able to determine where my voltage input needed to be because the other pin over here uh, didn't provide any voltage readings at all. So yeah. So I'm just gonna get those soldered in and then I'll strip it on the other side. So here's what I've decided I'm going to do in regards to the power and ground wire to the high def nest board. Uh, it's the instructions basically have everything set up so that you know you put it in, you solder it in, and then you screw it down, and you're good to go. And I suppose that's okay, but I like things to be a little more convenient. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and leave this basically the length that it is, which is a little too long, but that's okay because what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to cut it in half and then I'm going to use a combination of these right here. They're actually uh, crimp on QDCs, quick disconnects, but I'm not going to just crimp them on. I'm going to run the wire through, crimp it down, and then apply some solder in there as well to make sure it stays put. Uh, so the reason why I'm going to use these, and they'll be insulated of course when I'm done, but it will allow me, if I cut it in the middle, it would allow me to quickly disconnect or more easily disconnect these wires uh, apart from each other without actually having to remove the high desk NEF board from the case itself uh, in case I need to work on anything else for the main board. So that's what I'm going to do right now. We're just going to cut this and go from there. And like I said, I'm going to cut it basically, eh, give or take, kind of in the middle here. I will attach these ends to the high def NES board first.
and they are marked as to which one's power and which one's ground. So that'll make that easier. Unfortunately, the wires I am using are a little wider than what that's designed for. So I may have to use my boring tools. We're zoomed in here. <clears throat> Got my wire at the ready. Iron is on and ready to go. So let's get these soldered in. So awesome. Okay, so now I just got to trim off the edges of these. And then I'll prepare to put my crimp my connections in and solder them down, like I was talking about before. And just so you know, I usually alternate them. No real particular reason why, I guess. But you know, I'll put a spade on one side and the connector on one end, and then vice versa on the opposite end, just so it's less risk of ever crossing them if I'm not paying attention or if I don't have good lighting when I'm connecting things up. I'm going to go ahead and tin those up a little bit. And then before I put all these connectors on, I'm going to put some heat shrink tubing on them as well. So before I do that, I'll need to get this on there first. So I have to pull back a little more wire. There we go. These are monstrous crimpers but they do the job well. Okay, definitely on there. And again, this will slide over this to protect it and insulate it. And I just need to hit it with some solder. Probably, yeah, really warm. Should be. So I'll get that pushed in there. There. That one's in. Next one. This one will use a spade connector, so I'll need to make sure that I actually have a um, piece of heat shrink tube first before I put this in. These also come with a uh, piece of insulation for them, but they slide off real easily after I've crimped them, and I just don't like them, so I take them off and just use heat shrink. It's more reliable. All right. Oh, 
also in there good. Let's solder that down. Awesome. That went a little easier. And then I used the heat shrink tube to kind of place over it. Like that. Now normally I would use my blowtorch, my little miniature blowtorch for this, but since these are so small pieces of shrink tubing, I'm just gonna go ahead and just hit them with a lighter. There we go. So again, on the other side, I'll do the same thing and it'll connect up into another connector like this. So you can see that when it's all put together, they'll be nice and secured and uh, have a good connection and be easy to disconnect if I need to. So I'm gonna get the other side done and be right back. So I just wanted to show you real quick the quick disconnects I added between the power and the ground from the high def NES board to the power RF board. So I added an additional piece of uh, heat shrink tubing here just to keep these wires a little more together and manageable since I'd cut them apart so much wide. Uh, I didn't really do that here. It's not really that big a deal, but anyway, just wanted to show you that real quick. So now really all that's left to do is to assemble everything back together and test it out. So here we go. And looking at the anchor screw that they provided, or the mount screw for the high def NES board, uh, it is a small Allen bit. So I'm going to have to go get one of those real quick and be right back. Uh, and checking it out, I figured out that it is a 16 inch Allen or hex key that you'll need to attach this. So I guess there's really no right or wrong way. I'm going to just do this from the bottom and then come up. And I will mention that I did have to drill a hole for this because of course there wasn't one originally through the case here. Whoops. Whoops, that's one of those words you're not supposed to hear when you're working on stuff like this. Yeah. I'll just hand tighten that up a little bit for now. And again, I've got my little disconnect, so I will just pull this main board loose and get it out of the way for a second while I secure this down. pretty good. I don't think it's going anywhere. You can see the the screw here, the top of it uses the hex key to undo it. So yeah, board's not going anywhere. Now I could have done a much better job on the hole on the back of this, I'm afraid. But you know this this Nintendo's had some wear and tear its life. You can see that the labels are pretty faded and worn on this thing. So they were already kind of scratched up in the back as well, but there's the the hole I had to cut out to make room for the HDMI cable. It's a little bigger than it needed to be, but that's okay. It'll look all right. And I went ahead and just cut off the part of the sticker that was here because it was already worn as well. You can see how faded they are. It was just the channel select sticker. Now, uh, I do know that if you want to still continue to use the composite audio and video as well as the RF on the uh, Nintendo in addition to the high definition HDMI, then there is a transistor that must be removed off of this board according to the instructions. And that transistor, and this is a, uh, a top loader, or I'm sorry, not top loader, but this is a uh, uh, what they call the toaster model or the front loader. 
You have to remove transistor Q1. I don't know if my camera will zoom in on that. Q1. Now it's not this big one, it's actually the smaller one right here, this black piece right here is the transistor that needs to come off. In addition to that being removed, you're going to have to also apply a jumper from the first and last pins, or pins one and three, on the uh, up for where the transistor was as well. So that's what I'm going to do real quick right now. Sorry, I paused there for a second because I was fighting it a little more than I expected and I didn't, we didn't need to waste all that time seeing that. So I've got that jumper in place. It's right here. And it does stand up a little taller than I'd like, but I wanted to make sure that it sat where it needed to. And I already double checked this. When it's installed in the NES, it'll actually lay down like this. So I made sure to get my tray, which is used for my blinking light wind, and it's actually got plenty of clearance. So I don't know if that'll show up very well or not in the camera. The jumper's right here, but there's plenty of clearance that it's not going to hit anything that's going to be important. So yeah, we're good. So let's finalize this bad boy and get it buttoned up. All right, first thing I need to do is to put the new assembled interposers back in place. Again, making sure that on the silk screen that I line up what needs to go in the right direction. So we've got the CPU connector and we also have the PPU connector. Sorry, I've got them upside down, but you get the idea. And we also need to attach the thin ribbon cables that go onto these. And in looking at the pins, they're facing, okay, so the smaller ribbon cable here, I need to make sure that the will go on the PPU. And I only know this because it's going to sit closer to where the high def NES board is going to be placed. But in looking at how these connectors are arranged, the pins need to, the blue side needs to be facing like, basically you need the silver side to be facing up on you like this. So I'm gonna push that in, just like that. And try to get that locked down. There we go. So that one's in. I need to do the same thing to the CPU. It has a longer cable with it, but same thing applies. I need the silver side to be facing up for this part. So I'll just insert that in like that. And lock those down. Perfect. Okay, now I'm ready to reinstall them. Sure, it's in there good, nice and tight. Well, there's a lot of extra height on these compared to what there was before. And we do the same thing with the PPU. That went out a lot easier. Just like that. 
And then what will happen is the other ends of these cables here will wrap around and attach where they need to go on the high def NES board. So. Then I can hook up my wires again for power and ground. And again, since I made them the opposite type of connections, I don't even have to look at them. I just know one goes to one and one goes to the other because that's the only way they'll fit. Just like that. Okay. And then I need to reattach. Oh, by the way, because of the extra board and everything, the bottom shield can no longer be used with the set. So if you want to keep it, to keep it original, store it away somewhere, or recycle it. Okay. Now to get everything reconnected. Here's player two, player one. Sorry, I realize you can't see that. I'm just reattaching player two and player one's controller wires. And then finally, the main switching cable for the power and reset. Everything out of the way here. Okay. So at this point, I've got enough of this fastened down that I should be able to plug everything or be able to put a cartridge in and power it up and make sure that it's functioning. And so that's what I'm going to do real quick, and then uh, I will show you the final results. All fully assembled and ready to test. So let's test the game.